Hello and welcome to Diminishing Returns. This week, we're tackling Beverly Hills Cop, the 80s favourite that bled through into the 90s. With me, Alan Turing, as always, is Sol Harris. Hello. And our special guest host today is Gareth Allen. Hello. Hello, and Gareth, just to give you a quick introduction, Gareth's my brother, an older brother by a considerable amount, which is why he's here to represent the 80s. Um, considerable a considerable amount that's a little unfair (laughs) little bit of nepotism he's not made it here on merit like all the other guests (laughs) (laughs) oh yeah because usually (laughs) okay so Gareth just to uh, so just to intro you us uh, Beverly Hills Cop came out in what was it 85 hang on four I think 84 Four? 84. Okay, so I was born in 1984. Um, so that's all. So I was considerably <laughs> older than you then, by then. Wasn't I? Yeah, you are. You are considerably <laughs> older than me. Don't, don't, get, don't try and get away with that. But I do remember, I guess, I, I couldn't tell you what year it was, but I do remember when I was at ah, just starting so high school, so probably 88, 89, that sort of year. I remember Eddie Murphy was the biggest thing, he was the funniest star in the world you know he was he was huge so I can remember watching films like these Beverly Hills Cop and Golden Child and all those kind of 80s films and he was he was brilliant watching these films again they've not aged all that well to be blunt but they (laughs) you know the first two particularly they're still a lot funnier than you know his later output Ooh. Well, just to just to give you a bit of a just, just to mm. get of a bit of introduction to Gareth, my 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 film taste and other tastes of that has been influenced by Gareth because, uh, like I say, because you stole all my DVDs. Nine... Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> DVDs, videos, uh, um, and stuff like. It just made me think of it because you mentioned the Golden Child. The yeah. Golden Child is a classic, uh, nostalgia one for me, even though it was you know made you know when I was a very small child. But that is one of my childhood films, and that must be from your influence. Um, and I think you're so old, you guys. This is really, my, <laughs> like my equivalent. There is Good Burger, the Keenan and Kel like <laughs> spin-off. <laughs> but a lot of my musical tastes of, of of sort of indie bands from the early '90s, because that's when you were a teenager and you made mixtapes for me, yeah. <laughs> like gave us to yeah. an eight-year-old these mixtapes of like um, Sultans of Ping and Wonder Stuff. You don't stuff. like indie bands. <laughs> What are you talking about? What do I like then? You know, I the only time I've ever encountered you and music together was when you got really angry at me for calling the song its correct name, which is Two Princes, because you were <laughs> adamant that it was called Two Princess by the Spin Doctors. <laughs> well, why do you think I've even heard of the Spin Doctors? <laughs> no, you're not hanging that on me. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, so... Things like Beverly Hills Cop. Now, mm. to put that into context of Eddie Murphy's career, it was really early on. Beverly Hills Cop was like his third film or something. It was this was really still early Eddie Murphy because he he got famous through Saturday Night Live and then he did Forty Eight Hours, Trading Places, and that launched him as a, a movie star as well. Beverly Hills Cop, I think, made him more mainstream because. Uh, Trading Places was a comedy. This was a comedy, obviously, but it's an action film. It, I just think it was more widespread, and I might be wrong there. It's just sort of my I- interpretation of it. Then you had all the Saturday Night Live people, like you know, Eddie Murphy came from Saturday Night Live, but then there was you know there was Dan Aykroyd and Chevy Chase, and they were all making big films at that point. Bill Murray. But there is a bit of history of this that Beverly Hills Cop wasn't particularly conceived as a comedy. It was written as a. There's an often parroted sort of idea that it was written as a straight film. But well, it was rewritten. It's, it's my my understanding. You probably know more of this, so I'll I'll do mine and you correct it. <laughs> my understanding is it was written as a straight. Uh, sorry, people often say it was written as a straight vehicle with Sly Stallone in the lead, and then they cast Eddie Murphy, which turned it into a comedy. My understanding is it was actually written as a an action comedy for Sylvester Stallone to kind of break out and my God. do some comedy, which would explain why there are jokes written into the script that. Eddie Murphy being cast wouldn't account for. My understanding is that it was originally just written as a as an action cop drama thing. I don't know how serious it was trying to be, if it was just a sort of lightweight action. Then 
uh, it was rewritten. A new a new scriptwriter was brought on board to polish it up, and it was rewritten with much more comedic ideas. Then Stallone was signed on. He rewrote it himself. Now, whether that actually means he rewrote it or not, um, but in, in terms of the, I mean, pom- he he does writing. It probably yeah. did. You know, he's a um, he's quite a prolific writer. Do you think he writes comedy though, Sol? <laughs> no, no, no. He didn't. No, he didn't write his comedy. But that's a that's an interesting story because. Basically, he, he wrote Rocky, obviously. He's well known for that yeah. and made his career. But, um, for example, he's the he's the credited writer on Fist, which he didn't actually rewrite or barely rewrote. Um, this is something okay. I read about in Joe Esterhaus's autobiography. So that was a, also, obviously, I'm getting Joe Esterhaus's story there. He wrote it. And then Sylvester Stallone demanded the writing credit, even though he'd barely right. rewritten anything. But that was, anyway, that was way back then. But maybe he rewrote it. But the basic concept is Stallone rewrote it much straighter, much more action and much bigger, much bigger stuff going on. And they basically said the budget is not there. And he dropped out like with two weeks before they were going to shoot. Eddie Murphy comes in 12 days before they're going to shoot it. They revert back to the more comedic script they had. And then obviously, as you see on screen, Eddie Murphy is just chucking stuff out. He's doing doing his own thing. And that is kind of the secret chemistry that we find in Beverly Hills Cop. That's really interesting because it feels to me, watching them again, that it, it's basically a series of Eddie Murphy set-piece sketches strung together yeah. with, loosely with a story. So that's that's quite interesting. So I guess the story already existed and, and then he just came and did his own thing. It, it feels like, not quite improvised, but it feels like very, uh, well, very Eddie Murphy. Like he's just, you know, he's doing that on the hoof. Yeah, and you can tell there's ad-libbed lines that he's just dropping in. Can I get something out of my system before we carry on? Because it's, it's distracting me. Yeah. Do we sound the same? Ding dong. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's it's Eddie Murphy Bond. <laughs> I'm Eddie Murphy Bond, Shrek. Shrek. Oh, right. Waffles, Shrek. <laughs> my girl parties all the time, Shrek. You've been desperate to do your Eddie Murphy impression, haven't you? <laughs> it's pitch perfect. It's, it's spot on. Okay, well... He's here in the room with me now. Eddie Murphy Bond is white, for the record, so this isn't racist. Okay, <laughs> fine. Can't get me on that. I've been working on my Eddie Murphy laugh. Would you like to hear that? Go on. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds just like me, Shrek. Uh, you'll have to... Get Shrek, it. this guy's got a scared of death, Shrek. My girl parties all the time. <laughs> Homosexuals ain't allowed to look at my ass, Shrek. Are we sure this isn't <laughs> <laughs> uh, do you think when can I ask when when um, when Stallone wrote this script? Do you think it was quite as homophobic? <laughs> <laughs> it was the eighties. It was okay back then. And you know that is in all seriousness. If you watch uh, um, Eddie Murphy's live stand-up show, Delirious and Raw, yeah, I mean they are pretty <laughs> unwatchable these days. And I, I yeah, I've got to admit, when I was twelve and thirteen, I thought they were hilarious. And well, that's- uh, I still think they're hilarious, but definitely it's material that you just would not... Problematic. I'd, I'd say it's like like 70% of it holds up really well. Yeah. And then there's just kind of 30% where you're just like, oh, God. I have this nightmare that I go to Hollywood and find out that Mr. T is a faggot. <laughs> really? And he'd be walking up to people going, hey, boy. Hey, boy. You look mighty cute in them jeans. I kid the homosexuals a lot because they homosexuals. <laughs> I, I fuck with everybody. I don't give a fuck. It, it, it's like um, I don't mean anything by it. You can hang out with a gay person. You can, guys. Don't feel you know like alienate gay people because they're gay. Because you can play tennis with a gay person. Really, just after the game, you say, "I'm gonna get a beer. What you gonna do? Think I'll go suck somebody's dick?" Well, I see you later. <laughs> so let's get into it then. Let's let's start at the beginning. Uh, it starts with the city montage of Detroit, as as does. Oh my God! What 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 a shithole! <laughs> yeah, it's like it's like the worst place humans have ever existed. That's the impression they're trying to give you. Look at this! Look at this awful place where this. But that was it. Grown up. It's not just a, an eighties montage. It's it's of an eighties montage of of black Detroit. It's very much the sort of inner city crappy areas. It, it doesn't really come across. As intended, does it? I don't know. Look at how these people live! (laughs) Detroit in the 80s, my understanding, was a lot nicer than modern-day Detroit. I don't don't know about that. (laughs) Well, no, isn't Detroit kind of 
isn't modern Detroit really bad because of like unemployment and stuff that's like really hit it in the last um I think there's some real like issues with industries like closing down and moving away and I think for the last 10 years or so it's almost ghost town kind of mm. stuff yeah it's actually, all car so. manufacturers in, in, in Detroit. The purpose here is to go, look, this is a shitty city that he works in, because we're going to see Beverly Hills later, so yeah. let's wait for that. I don't think that juxtaposition ever really comes across like it's meant to be. I, I kept forgetting that the joke yeah. of the film is that he's like a well, rough city cop in a I don't know, like he definitely, hoity-toity... It's a culture clash film. I mean, that's the concept, isn't it? Yeah, rough, rough cop goes to fancy, ta- politically correct town. I kept forgetting that that was the... The, the idea behind it when I was watching it. I had to keep reminding myself, oh yeah, it's because he's the Detroit cop and he does things differently and they do it by the book. Yeah, I, I kind of I liked that. I liked how it worked and that they, they sort of clashed, but the, the way they clash, the way he clashes with the other police that he meets there, it's never very antagonistic and I think that's a very important thing of Axel Foley's character that he does respect these other police and and he works with them and they they find their common ground and everything like that and it's more Mm. of a culture clash rather than actually working against each other so you can play it for laughs Um, and I like that I like the tone it's set I like the balance and they sort of end up as friends at the end and all that sort of thing that worked for me it's a mutual respect Can, can we talk about the Detroit cops before we go to Beverly Hills because yeah. we get, as well as Axel, we've got the, and we've got a classic police captain. Where the fuck you been, Foley? Wait a second, look, I just thought that there was a problem. Don't think, Axel, it makes my dick itch. It's, it, you know, <laughs> it's ticking a lot of boxes for me. Well, actually, I, I, when I was watching this again, I was like, who is this guy? Because he doesn't seem like an actor. He's sort of like a bit mm. too kind of natural, but I've looked him up. Do you guys know who he is? No, no, not at all. He's well, basically, he's a he's a police officer from Detroit. Ah, these really? are the, these three films are the only acting he's ever done. Um, and he was like, he was still working as a police officer at the time, although he was like a, in a desk job at that point. Um, so yeah, he was that guy. He says the only difference between me and this character is I don't swear as much. How did he? How did it come about? That he I have got... no idea. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. It's weird. That's an it? odd bit of casting, isn't it? Yeah, I don't know. Someone must have just known him, and it was like, oh well, we need a cheap, a chief guy who's like shouts at everyone. Was he an LA, an LA cop? No, I think he's from Detroit. He didn't like pull over the producer with like a load of heroin <laughs> in his car. And... It was cocaine. It was the eighties. And be like, well, here's my headshot. You know, if uh, maybe we can make this all go away. You know, that's how it works in LA, and everyone's carrying headshots. <laughs> Um, but yeah, he, he he said he had other offers for acting and never took them up. He just concentrated on his police job. So these were the only films he did. Got cases to crack. That's odd. Because if odd, you're going to do three films and out, I'm sure you could pick three better films. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but maybe maybe he, he wasn't had that many options. <laughs> yeah, he wasn't getting cast in period dramas, so the film itself starts with like the we 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 establish Eddie Murphy's character uh, by seeing him. You know, in a classic sort of opening scene, we see him doing what he's he's generally doing. So he's undercover, he's doing this job, and it all sort of goes tits He's a businessman. <laughs> that, that opening is fantastic as well. It it just it sets the tone so well. The comic timing and like the framing of of that police car kind of yeah just rolls <laughs> overshooting it and then sort of awkwardly turning and driving very slowly <laughs> down the alleyway towards them. It's it's fantastic. Although the the actual truck chase itself left me a little bit kind of. Uh, I don't know, it just seemed... It didn't feel like it was edited like with great pace. Yeah. It just felt a bit lacklustre. And the music just felt like it had been arbitrarily chucked on top rather than sort of edited to, to work. It felt like um, people who have no idea how to make an action movie being like, shit, we've got to chuck an action <laughs> yeah. scene in at the start just to establish it's an action comedy. And the, the director is uh, Martin Brest. <laughs> There's nothing <laughs> funny about that. <laughs> Uh, you know, hasn't hasn't made a lot of films, but he did Midnight Run, which is a comedy. He made Scent of a Woman, which Al Pacino won an Oscar for, and then Meet Joe Black, which is that. Um, <laughs> yeah. um, so he hasn't done a lot. His last film was Gili, so that <laughs> tells you where his career went. Was a... well, weirdly, he's sort of the least notable director to helm one of these films. Yeah, yeah, we'll come back to that. Then we go back with Eddie Murphy and he meets up with his old school friend who's like some low-life sort of hoodlum. 
Can, can I just can I just talk about Eddie Murphy's uh, or Axel Foley's childhood because he's got some odd friends. Like <laughs> you know, he's made it as a as a cop, uh, and he's got a mate here who's clearly a bit dodgy. And then his other old friend from back in the day it runs an art gallery in Beverly Hills. How did that happen? <laughs> yeah. And... <laughs> yeah, they have a lovely little reminisce. And then he says, oh, I love you, man. And this guy could not be more dead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so this friend of his gets killed over some sort of dodgy crime business uh, by that bloke who's now we all know from Breaking Bad. So then basically that sets up the plot. Eddie Murphy has to go renegade because the chief won't let him investigate the crime, so he has to go investigate in his own time. The chief won't let him investigate the crime, so he has to go investigate in his own time. The chi- chief won't let him investigate the crime, so he has to go investigate in his own time. And he has to go to Beverly Hills to do it. That's the setup. That's your start of the film. And he has to pretend he's not doing it. He has to keep a low profile, yeah. Yeah, so then a new city, new montage. Beverly Hills is so much nicer than Detroit. <laughs> and whiter. <laughs> There was a lot of uh, there was a lot of um, semi naked ladies in that montage, and I, I think just in case we hadn't made it very clear, we can't stress enough that Eddie Murphy is heterosexual. You can I did die jokes about homosexuals about a couple years ago, and faggots were mad. They were like, and they were. It's nothing like having a nation of fags looking for you. I'd be at parties. There's always two or three homosexuals at a party, and they'd be standing around looking at you. They'd be looking at you. He's an asshole. Let's make that very clear here and now. It just it seemed a little overt to me. <laughs> so we watched we watched True Romance um, yeah. the other week, featuring a scene stealing uh, character of Bronson Pinchot, and here we have him Which again. One was that? Uh, he's the he was the you know the the film producer's uh, aide. Wait, that's what he plays Serge. Yeah, he's Serge. Is he? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> Another scene-stealing role. Yeah, I mean, he he's the one guy in this film who kind of takes Zeddy Murphy on and, and yeah. arguably um, overshadows him, frankly. <laughs> like, he, like, really improv-heavy. You can tell they're oh, both yeah, just, yeah, yeah. like, completely uh, riffing off each other. And I think most actors would be a bit intimidated by, you know... <laughs> Eddie Murphy's kind of quick talking like this and really loud, and he, you know, doesn't stop talking. And then Serge just just goes with it. You know, go and do a Serge impression as well. No, sir. I will not shut the fuck up. All yes. that sort of stuff. <laughs> it's basically the same impression for both of them. Shut the fuck up! I know I cannot shut the fuck up. Get the it's fuck true. out of here! Yeah. So basically, the whole thing is he's funny because he's got a funny voice. <laughs> That's, that, what more do you want? <laughs> It was the 80s. It was all right. It was fine. He does... No, the way they spar off each other works really well, as well as just a funny accent. We we establish here Eddie Murphy's old school friend, this woman who works in the art gallery. And I say this woman because I can't remember her character name. Um, and I think that's important because she kind of gets lost in the plot here. And she's very significant in it. And in fact, she's like, no, I want to go along. I want to tag along. And, and she's she doesn't just sort of help him out and then gone. She's really involved in the plot. And just somehow gets lost. The character's not big enough, or or uh, the way it's played. Or that's a common theme with all three of these films. There's a sort of uh, a sort of helpless woman with no agency who who just bumbles along in the plot. Well, the thing is, I don't I don't think she's helpless. She's kind of really like he's like trying to get her to like leave it, and she's like, no, I'm coming with you. I'm gonna get stuck in. But then she's there and doesn't do anything. It's, so it's pointless having her there. And I do know that in the Stallone. Uh, version it was a love interest um and i do really like that they don't have that they just don't bother put, trying to put a love subplot into it i i, I agree I, I was surprised i was surprised that that, that didn't happen and and it, it got me thinking well actually there's not there's no love interest at all in this in this film i don't think you would have a white woman love interest for eddie murphy in 1984 i do i just don't think that hollywood would do that they gave him a love interest in the third one and she's black there will there are film major film produce, uh, producers now who would just not allow that They're like no it won't play in the midwest or whatever like yeah but... what what race was eddie murphy's love interest in coming to america i can't remember black she was black she's african american okay. what other films has he even had a love interest in nutty professor was she black in that yeah, yeah they're all they're all black it's always black 
What about Meet Dave? Isn't it Elizabeth Banks and Meet Dave? Who does the voice of Mrs. Shrek? <laughs> it's, a da- it's a dragon. Shrek! <laughs> Shrek! I'm in love with a dragon, Shrek! Is that well? Well, there you go. That's a that's a mixed race relationship. Isn't Shrek! It? <laughs> I fuck this dragon, Shrek. <laughs> Is that an outtake. So we we now establish our villain, the main big bad. Big bad wolf, Shrek. Oh my god. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> um, and very classic eighties uh, British villain in an American film. There's a brief little head to head between them. And then he has Eddie Murphy thrown out of the building. And I love it because they literally <laughs> just march him out and then throw him through a plate glass window. And then Why did he in... do that? Why did <laughs> he do just... that? There's no need for that. <laughs> Talk about drawing attention to him. Well, yeah. And then they've got to, like, you know, phone up the repair guy to come and install a new window, pay for it. It's ridiculous. <laughs> glass everywhere. And, and oh yeah, and he does the bit when he's checking into the hotel. He, he has a little rant there. But this is what really works for me about uh, the character that he's, you know, he's a, he's a character actor and he's a, he's a con man. And he, he just, he goes into a situation, sort of sums it up immediately. And then like, right, what, what do I need to play here to get what I want? And it just gives Eddie Murphy so much opportunity to mess about, to put but, to, but you know, to do. They're the, they're the funny bits of the film. They're the bits I remember from 30 years ago. And, yeah. and, you know, the story's almost incidental, really, because it, it's an Eddie Murphy vehicle. That's why I like it. <laughs> well, c- can we talk about Taggart and Rosewood? Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah, so we... we Classic comedy sidekicks. We established the other side of this uh, comedy setup. Yeah, the, the Beverly Hills cops, who are kind of stuffed white shirts. Judge Reinhold. Yeah, Judge Reinhold. Can I talk about Judge Reinhold? Because I loved Judge Reinhold. Really? Well, what what else has he done? Well, well, this is the point. So he was <laughs> like after the Beverly Hills Cop and the second one, he was he was a massive star. And the biggest thing he was really in was um, Vice Versa, which was a, a remake of Freaky Friday. <laughs> Where he swaps bodies. Oh God! Like and he, you know, he was he was he was going to be a big star, and it never really happened. So I I, I, I did a little bit of research, and apparently apparently it was just a nightmare to work with. <laughs> really? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he's got a great name. Well, he doesn't come across as a great actor here. Um, I mean, I know him. I know. I know him from Fast Times at Ridgemont High. That's sort of what he was famous for. But um, yeah, I don't think ever singing is. I know him from Five Seconds on Arrested Development. Well, it looks like we've got a mistrial, but on the plus side, we've also got a hung jury. Hit it! <laughs> Acting's highest honor, Judge Reinhold. Judge Reinhold is neither a real judge nor has he received acting's highest honor. <laughs> um, I'm just looking. I was just looking at his CV, and there's a there's an episode of the Clerks TV series in 2000 in which he plays the Honorable Judge Reinhold. Um, Brilliant. Which is seems to be an episode that was a courtroom drama one. So that joke had obviously been done before <laughs> the rest of development. Did it. Has the jury reached a verdict? Hold it. I need your help, man. All right. Axel. (laughs) I'm sorry. They're all out of bananas. Axel? Don't go. Honey, wake up. What? Oh. I had that dream again. I'm <laughs> rapidly amending my sequel pitch. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, the other guy who plays the, the other cop is John Ashton. Again, never really seen him in anything else. He's one of those jobbing actors that turns up in things. Um, but as a duo, they work. Judge Reinhold plays, like Rosewood is the sort of slightly more naive, wide-eyed one who's like really impressed by Axel Foley. Taggart is... More cynical, world weary. So it works. It's a nice little duo. They play off each other. It's all right, isn't it? Why do you, why do you keep saying duo <laughs> with a J? <laughs> uh, so, why is he called Taggart? What's that about? <laughs> what came first? There's been a mad duck. This or the Scottish one? Uh, I don't know, actually. I'm pretty sure the writers weren't watching the BBC. <laughs> 
Yeah, and then he, take, he takes uh, Taggart and Rosewood to the strip club because, again, I can't emphasize this enough, he likes girls. So, and I can't believe we haven't met before, but I'm a huge fan. And I'm a huge fan of yours. I think what? you're so funny oh. for years and years and sweet and sexy and oh. funny oh, and the whole well. thing. Yeah. Yeah. I have, a, uh, I have a, a, a funny, funny girl fetish. When women are funny, that, that's really... That's sexy to me. You oh. and who's the girl on Saturday Night Live? Maya Rudolph, she's uh -huh. sexy. Yeah. And Lucy. Uh -huh. Lucy, but when I was a kid, I used to watch Lucy with her. I was yeah. like, <laughs> yeah, I love Lucy too. <laughs> yeah, you need uh -huh. I have you singing Baba Lou, Lucy. Uh -huh. <laughs> 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 and immediately spots a couple of chaps there. Uh, just, just coincidentally, had just gone there to uh, shoot up the strip club. Um, just at yeah. the time they were going to have a drink. I don't know why, but okay, that's fine. It gives, it, it, it makes uh, them respect each other. Taggart now respects him. Blah blah blah. Then there's a big shootout. <laughs> there's a massive shootout at the end, which even that is sort of peppered with a few gags here and there. You know, it's your classic '80s cop movie ending. <laughs> I really like this film. <laughs> I really like the film, and I just keep remembering remembering bits and going, "Oh, that was good." <laughs> I think I would like to watch you sat watching the film with headphones in, so you just get a. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'd enjoy that. <laughs> um, I think it just sort of. <laughs> Tickles me in the right way. <laughs> um, I like. What is that about? Is that how Eddie Murphy actually laughs? Or I guess so. It's definitely. I guess it must be. It's not just this film that he does it. So are you sure? Because they they make a big thing out of it in this film, and like some characters even sort of acknowledge that it's a weird laugh. So I could completely believe it was like a weird character trait he developed for the part. <laughs> no, that's how he laughs that's how he laughs in all his films. And I think yeah. I think if I, okay. if I'm remembering rightly on the on the raw and delirious as well, which is <laughs> <laughs> You're doing more of a fat Albert. <laughs> <laughs> is that one of his nineties films? <laughs> <laughs> he managed to uh he did get a Richard Pryor impression in there at one point as well. He likes doing that. Uh, one of his little characters that he took on. I like doing impression trick. <laughs> it's amazing he didn't put on a prosthetic face and uh, play a, an old Chinese man at any point, really. <laughs> well, <laughs> do you think he could do Japanese Bond style? <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, oh man, no, no. The beauty of Japanese Bond is that he's um, Scottish. <laughs> he, he walks the line between two cultures. You know, he's he's there's nuance to him. He's, he's a bit Scottish. He's a bit Japanese. <laughs> it's a very subtle humour. He doesn't he doesn't get it. <laughs> Eddie Murphy Bond gets it. <laughs> Why is it Eddie Murphy Bond when it's actually Donkey Bond? <laughs> okay. Can we, can we can we get Eddie Murphy Bond to do an impression of Japanese Bond? See what comes out. <laughs> Okay. Oh, Gazal Gazal Mastri. Quite pleased with that. <laughs> I've got to tell you, I wasn't expecting to hear the words, I was quite pleased with that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, look, like, my, my comedy is not as. Um... <laughs> It's not as well thought through as, as Eddie Murphy's, all right? I know when he went up on stage, you've been working on that set for for a while. For me, it's all about living in the moment. you just got to point yourself in a direction and, and hope something comes out. Can, can we do Eddie Murphy jokes about that? I, I said, like, something about him shagging Mel B or something. How many kids has Eddie Murphy got with different women? It's quite a lot, isn't it? <laughs> Imagine being Eddie Murphy's kid. <laughs> What a life that'd be. Whoa. He's got nine children. <laughs> oh. <laughs> wow. <laughs> wow. No wonder he has to keep doing those films. <laughs> oh, there's a lot of child support. Mel Brown. Oh, he had a kid with her. Oh, yeah. Well, he didn't accept that for several years, but yeah. <laughs> oh, was that it? <laughs> I couldn't remember until... what it was. I knew there was some messy tabloid The DNA stuff test had to, to be taken, but yeah. Shrek, it's not mine, Shrek. It looks more like a dragon to me, Shrek. <laughs> Okay, so the first film. Shall we do ratings? Anything else you want to say? No. Sol? 
Haunted Mansion, Shrek. I was in the Haunted Mansion. <laughs> Just saying Shrek after every sentence doesn't, doesn't make it work. Well, it's a good signpost, so we know what you're doing. I, I have one, one, one last question on this film. Oh, yeah? What would really happen if you put a banana in the exhaust of a car? <laughs> um, I, I don't really know about cars, but would it stall immediately? I mean, you, if your exhaust is blocked, you, the gases can't escape. I think it would back up pretty quickly, yeah. I don't know how. Okay. I don't know if it would be a matter of seconds, but I bet it wouldn't take long. Yeah, I think, I think you'd get partway down the road first. Especially, spe- I mean, it depends how big a banana it is. I just like, thought it was an incredibly effective uh, disabling technique. Well, it's meant to be like a potato, isn't it? Because that can actually like fit over the exhaust and it's airtight. Whereas yeah. a banana, you'd, you'd, there'd be like space for the gas to fit around, wouldn't it? Depends on the size of your banana. I'm gonna, I'm gonna just go out and say it. I gave this film a nine out of ten. I loved it. What? Wow. <laughs> I was surprised as well. I think in my memory, I probably would have given it a nine, but I've, I've said seven. I don't know. It's just the the tone of humour is just exactly right for me. 80s Eddie Murphy works for me perfectly. The action was just enough. So I'd seen this film a number of times before, but I think I'd always just kind of watched it in pieces on TV. It's not, It used to be on TV a lot. I don't know if it still is. I think this was the first time I'd really ever sat down to watch it properly. And... It it's a really good film. Like it really it it holds up so well. I think it's one of the the real crown jewels of eighties comedies. Um, I'd put it right up there with things like Ghostbusters and uh, uh, what's another one? <laughs> Golden Child. <laughs> <laughs> it was better than I remembered it being because I was properly giving it my full attention and appreciating how well directed it was and how everything was complimenting the humour and Well stop burying the lead, tell us what you gave it (laughs) There's more to it than just Steady Murphy, so um, I bumped my score up actually from a 7 to an 8. I'm genuinely surprised that I gave this the lowest mark (laughs) (laughs) I thought you two would just think it was rubbish (laughs) We're we're very difficult to predict sometimes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is an excellent comedy. I'm pleased you enjoyed it, but I'm surprised. But '80s Eddie Murphy is a bit to me like early 2000s Vince Vaughn. Uh, <laughs> uh, High praise. '80s Adam I... Sandler. It's a bit. It just gets me. If we're comparing Eddie Murphy to Vince Vaughn, then this is his swingers. You know, it's it's him making a good, legitimately good film early on in his career it, it, before he sold out <laughs> basically this is <laughs> I'll stand by it I, I, I think this is a great little film we haven't touched on the music should we mention that quickly oh yeah do, do, yeah good do, point do, 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 well the music is classic 80s isn't it this is perfect this is exactly the right sort of music yeah yeah, yeah it's, 80s, it? it's, it's one of the truly iconic movie themes I'd say honestly well has the crazy frog done the Star Wars theme no there you go bing, bing. What's going on? Alan, do a crazy frog impression. <laughs> bah, bah. That, that's what he does. <laughs> <laughs> it's a precursor to the minions, I've just realised. <laughs> oh, um, I'm just reading here. It basically, Harold Faltermeyer was a you know a music producer and composer. You know, that's pretty much what he does. But it says here that his Axel F theme, he called it uh, the banana theme. The banana in the (laughs) tailpipe. There you go. Shall we move on to Beverly Hills Cop 2? Let's. If we have to. Oh, that sounds ominous. (laughs) Okay. Uh, We do have to, actually, yeah. Beverly Hills Cop 2 is a few years later. They bring in uh, Tony Scott. uh, Hot Tony Scott. Had like my dragon, (laughs) Shrek. She beats fire, (laughs) Shrek. I've run out of Shrek (laughs) quotes, so I'm just just riffing. (laughs) I remember he's with a dragon... Uh, the print, though no, the king was short. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> Tony Scott's direction in the second film. It, it, I'm an <laughs> ogre. <laughs> That's not even relevant. You didn't even do that last week when we were doing Inglorious Bastards. <laughs> <laughs> Beverly Hills Cop Two. Tony Scott comes in to direct, and it is immediately 
much darker, like in cinematography, it's darker, but also just in the tone of it, it's not as funny. How did you guys feel about it? It feels like it's more violent. I'd never seen either of the sequels before. I'd sort of been meaning to watch them for ages because I, I always thought, like, yeah, it's probably not as good as the first, but I bet it's good fun. Just you know, easy, easy watching. Um, no, <laughs> no, it's really bad. <laughs> Yeah. Well, in my in my memory, now I, I've never really seen Beverly Hills Cop three before. So in my memory, one and two are very close to each other. And I, I've got to be honest with you, when I was watching the first one, I was surprised that Bridget Nielsen wasn't in it. Where the hell's Bridget Nielsen? <laughs> okay. So in my memory, they were basically the same thing. But okay. I, but yes, I totally agree. There's a real there's a real different feel to this film. It felt as if they'd heard the the first film was intended as a straight action movie and then they cast Eddie Murphy and that made it funny and they thought all right we'll just make a straight really bland generic action movie again and Eddie Murphy will make it funny and, and then he didn't it didn't work <laughs> he, yeah he didn't work. because that's not why the first one was funny because it, it, you know they actually tried to make it into a comedy and there's there's a handful of incredibly cringy scenes in this uh, there aren't many at the start, but towards the end, it's like they re- like the rushes were coming in, and Tony Scott was like, "Guys, why isn't it funny?" Uh, and they started thinking, "Right, we better add some scenes where Eddie Murphy improvises his yeah. way into like a room or a, a diner or a function or something," and they just don't work. Yeah, those those little set pieces that we that we talked about before, where where, where the, the the film is hung on, they're just not as good. They're just not as funny. Desperate. They feel like desperate callbacks to a to the first film, a better film. And apparently Axel and Bogomel are like fishing buddies now. It's ridiculous, isn't it? Like the stakes are raised. The stakes are raised because Bogomil's been shot and Axel's furious because this guy who he met once and hated, but then hated a bit less by the end, has been shot. I hated the broad premise of this film because it feels so unbearably like a sequel and like an old sequel. I, I, I truly believe that Hollywood has got its head around how to make sequels a lot more in modern times compared to what it used to do. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's such a machine now that sequels, I think, just tend to be a lot better on average. Whereas in the olden days, they they were, you know... It was a remake. ...contrived premises to to rehash the same thing again. And that's what this is. It bends over backwards to get him back to, to Beverly Hills and get these same characters he was thrown into a situation with, like, working alongside him again. And it doesn't work, because, like, this should have just been a film with Axel Foley going somewhere else. He should have gone to Prague or something, I don't know. Like, it doesn't have <laughs> yeah, to be in Beverly yeah, Hills to work. that would have been the thing to do, yeah. Axel Foley in a completely new environment. What about, what about the bad guys in this? I mean, I was grumbling about Burkhoff, but in this film we've got Dean Stockwell, Bridget Nielsen, and Jürgen Prochnow. What a team. <laughs> well, that's it. it doesn't quite work, does it? I mean, Can we talk about Bridget Nielsen? Because she made quite an impression on me in my teenage years. <laughs> you know, I, I've spoken to a few, um, dare I say, older gentlemen. Steady. Um, and they all seem to really love this second film. But it, it seems to be purely out of nostalgia. Yeah, I agree with that. Well, I, I'm not. I'm not very happy with the character development of uh, of Billy. You know, he's turned from oh, yeah. um, from a sort of wide-eyed innocent into a psychopath. I like Billy Ghost Gruff, personally, Shrek. It, it's sort of cute that he's got all these weapons, but he's he's just he's just a, he's a dangerous individual. He shouldn't he shouldn't have a, <laughs> he shouldn't have a police badge. He shouldn't even be uh, out in public. You know, it's to be in a <laughs> medical prison. There's no attempt to make it work with the previous character or, or explain that he's changed in some way. Or I'll tell you about changing Shrek. Change from an ogre into a human being, Shrek. True love's kiss, Shrek. That's how you change. I'm a, no- I'm a noble steed. I'm a noble steed, Shrek. <laughs> let's talk. Let's talk about okay. Let's talk about the the alphabet crimes because I I still I'm still not entirely clear on what the plan was here. Was the motive to cover up for the the insurance job at the end? Yeah. Like we're gonna commit we're gonna commit these five or six random crimes just to cover up that it's an inside job on the seventh one. Basically, that's what it was, yeah. Which... Also, when they shot Bogomil, okay, when they shot Bogomil and they're talking about it, they said that, oh, these guys are already investigating the alphabet crimes. How are they investigating the alphabet crimes when there's only been an A? <laughs> <laughs> All that we're focusing on is Axel Foley, who straight away zooms in on the main bad guy and is like, okay, he's something going on here. So we don't even get the wild goose chase element of it to then have a bit of a reveal later on. We all love a wild goose chase from town to time. Wild golden goose chase. 
Climb up that stalk, you come down with a nice big golden goose egg. Doesn't he find... Is it this, is it this film where he I use a, I use a golden goose egg to make me some golden waffles. Okay. So did you actually watch this film, Saul? So <laughs> do, do you want my input regarding this film? I'm just looking yeah, at my come notes. On. <laughs> Ding on, dong. Oh no, it's Gilbert Gottfried Bond. I, I pay my tickets. I pay, I pay all my tickets. Sir, do you own a black Mercedes-Benz license plate number CRL 507? 507? That's my wife's car. That's not my car. That's my wife's car. Yeah, unpaid I mean, tickets. it's under my name, but it's my wife's car. No, no, no. Bitch! The tickets have not been paid. That means you're liable. Can you cuff Mr. Bernstein, please? Cuff me! Mr. There are Bern- people out there with chainsaws. You're cuffing me. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'll, I'll give it to him. That's probably the highlight of the film. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. But yeah, give Eddie Murphy someone who can actually like go toe to toe with him. And but that's not like... even what happens. It's not. It's not like Surge where they're like interacting. <laughs> Eddie Murphy just kind of stands in the corner and like has a cigarette <laughs> break whilst Gilbert Gottfried <laughs> shouts. <laughs> <sighs> okay. I mean, that's that's all I've really got to say. I, I was blown away with how bad this film was. I, I didn't expect it to be this bad. I gave it a five. So I was expecting like a, a six at worst a five. This is a three from me. It's <laughs> abysmal. Everyone in, involved should be ashamed with themselves. Um, <laughs> I mean, it, currently it stands as one of Eddie Murphy's worst films that I've seen, which is saying something. That is saying something. I, ha- I have seen Meet Dave. <laughs> so, Shrek! I can only say a thousand words, then I can't speak no more, Shrek. <laughs> uh, Gareth? I would give it a six, but I think five of those marks are for Bridget Nielsen. I like my women a bit more chunky than that. Nice, flaming, hot, chunky dragons. <laughs> we jump forward a few years um, to 1994, ten years after the original film came out, mm. um, for Beverly Hills Cop 3. Yes, uh, directed by convicted manslaughterer John Landis. <laughs> um, John Landis, can we have a conversation about John Landis? I, could, yeah. I couldn't believe this was directed by John Landis when I looked it up. I, I couldn't... I, I, I mean, let me put my cards on the table here. This is terrible. Yeah. And, you know, I have happy memories of John Landis, again, f- f- a little bit earlier than this. I, c- I can't believe he made this film. Well, I think John Landis is generally overrated. I, like, even his good films, I'm not that fussed by. Trading Places, mm. I like... Coming to America, I like, but I think that's more to do with Eddie Murphy than the direction, particularly. I think An American Werewolf in London is a an incredible piece of work. Um, and very well directed, yeah. actually. But I must admit... I See, I've never been that bothered by it. And you've got your likes of Animal House and the Blues Brothers that yeah, never quite stuck but... with me. Not that they're bad films or anything, but... Most of his filmography, from what I've seen, is is very pedestrian. And just kind of plainly directed, and yeah, I mean that's more his latter stuff. To be fair, so I don't know. Maybe he just kind of gave up when everyone hated him after he killed those kids. But um... <laughs> <laughs> I think the fact that he like was convicted of manslaughter pretty much killed his career. I I, I don't think we can overstate how when was bad that the impact that had on his career. Well, it, it was when they were doing Four, Twilight Zone. Twilight Zone was eighty three, but. There was it was quite a prolonged legal thing before yeah. he was convicted of anything. And you know but, what? Is it? I mean, is it the director's fault? Well, I don't know. I mean, I think if if someone is killed in a in a stunt gone wrong, isn't that on the producer and the stunt people? Well, the who stunt were meant to coordinator be has got yeah. it, that. That's their responsibility. A director is not going. Oh, I think those ropes should be a bit tighter or whatever. Like, it's not his responsibility. It's not his job. Yeah. He's not gonna unless that was the point of the court case was that well, he was I think like, it probably was. fuck yeah. you, stunt coordinator can piss off, we're doing this shot now, whether you like yeah. it or not. Uh, I don't care about your safety concerns. Do it or you're fired. One of those kind of yeah. situations, yeah. Yeah, so what John Landis said they'd, they'd fallen out after coming to America because Eddie Murphy was an arsehole, and then this was like their reunion thing, and yeah, it's awful. It's terrible. It is, yeah. it is awful. I mean, I mean, I'll come out and say it, I think this is a huge improvement over the second one. God, okay. huge, Soul. huge do want, improvement. Do you want us to explain why you're wrong, or do you want to do your bit first? <laughs> well, go on. What, what's so bad about it compared? The second one is like just boring. None of it is funny, remotely funny. Bits of it, like very little of the second one, even feels like it's trying to be funny. But then when it does try to be funny, it's painful. Um, the plot is just 
the most bland, uninteresting, boring shit rehashing the first film. This it's one, a boring plot, but at least there is a plot where this one does not attempt mm. to do anything. It's it's mm. I don't it's know. so I, I... it's so low energy. No, it's... I don't know about that. I mean, you can you can tell they spent all their money on building this theme park, so they want to get their you know worth <laughs> out of it. Oh god, that that scene where he rescues the kids from the ride. That's oh, great. That lasted about twenty five minutes. That is a great scene. I was going to point to it. It was terrible. No, it's not. No. It's awful. Like, you're watching. I, I can only assume that's a real stuntman jumping from like carriage to carriage for real. There are shots in that that are amazing. Well, yeah, it must be because it when you can see Eddie Murphy, it's obviously and a green then, screen. Yeah, cut to Eddie Murphy in front of a fake yeah, sky yeah. on a thing. Really badly shot stuff. And. Yeah, too long with no gags. That's the main problem. There's no, there's, it's not funny. It's a, st- it's an action set. Piece. Well, yeah, but I got used to that in the second film. That was n- the second one's ninety minutes with no gags, so I was used to it. So I was just enjoying the third one as a straight action scene. I genuinely, I think that scene on the merry-go-round thing is like up in the sky is a really great action scene. It's, it's yeah, obviously it's a stuntman and not Eddie Murphy, but it, there's some really great low-key action there, and that the fact that it isn't like. A massive deal. You're just watching this guy doing this, these perilous bits of jumping up high. It... And it didn't actually affect the plot because I thought, well, at the end of this, he's now a hero and they'll they'll all have to listen to him. And they didn't. They just, you know, they whisked him off and he was a prisoner yeah, again. That's true. That, that was yeah, out of nothing. Yeah. I like honestly, there's actually jokes in this third one, and there weren't jokes in the second one. There's just little gags that feel feel like John Landis touches, honestly. Just just things like the you know, there's that bit when a costume character like covers the kids' eyes when they're all watching something and just little yeah. touches like that that are comedic little details. And I'm not saying they're hilarious, but they, they give the film a sense of comedy that's just completely lacking from the second one. I think that's a huge part. There's a warmth to the third one that isn't present in the second one. Mm. Um, I mean, yeah, it's not as dark as the second, but it's just not. It's just no good. It felt to me like a kids' film. It was like a kids' comedy, and then occasionally he would say, "You know, you useless motherfucker," under his breath, and I'm like, oh, oh, it's not a kids' film. Yeah, yeah. Well, another thing, John Ashton apparently didn't want to come back and do the third film or whatever. He wasn't. Is that Taggart? Yeah. Donkey. Made... There's been they... a murder. John Landis <laughs> done a murder of donkey. <laughs> <laughs> You know what else John Landis did that's really bad? Go on. He sired Max Landis. <laughs> yeah. Like the, okay, so the, the scene with Serge, where now he's, now he's gone from running an art gallery to running a gun show, yeah, that obviously. Was, that was... I mean, it was terrible, but it, it, but it also went on three times too long. It just kept going. But th- th- literally in this film, they, they, sh- they shoot at him and try and shoot him with a, to kill him in the middle of a family fun park... In the middle of de- like, what if they'd actually hit him? Then they sort of drag off his twitching corpse. What? Like yeah, and, what? And they say it's a parade. The fungineers <laughs> are trying out something new. <laughs> like the there's so many points where you can just sort of flash his badge and go, okay, look, I'm I'm arresting you for trying to shoot me, <laughs> right or whatever. Like he, it's like he's forgotten that he's a policeman and and that he's like having to run away and and hide and stuff like that. And, and as we know, all the security team are... Well, they all look suspiciously like stuntmen. Um, but, uh, you know, but they're all definitely on the bad guy's side. So, And they all run around the park at night shooting people. Fortunately, um, Axel finds one of those bulletproof benches to hide behind while they... Oh, yeah. <laughs> I noticed that one, yeah. guns. <laughs> <laughs> that that, yeah, I mean, that, that scene that where he has the he has the the crazy big gun that Serge gave him, yeah. that is that is a painful scene. So <laughs> defend that scene. Come on. He doesn't know which band the press, Rick. <laughs> <laughs> Much hilarity as the music plays and the guy waits rather than shoots him because it's quite a funny moment. But it's like if you're going to do that, have three distinct comedy things, not one, and then one that's basically the same, yeah. it's just playing yeah. the radio. Oh, it's another song. song. And then yeah, yeah, but... I needed like a, a pop tart to come out of it. Yeah, exactly. That would have been there. We go. In within seconds, you've just come up with something better than what they did. Ding dong, ding dong. <laughs> oh, <laughs> hello, it's me, George Lucas Bond. <laughs> <laughs> what a great cameo! What an asshole! Oh, he's just gone. <laughs> <laughs> I was in Mulan. <laughs> Is there anything else? I mean, 
I just thought it was awful. You know? I thought it was dreadful. Oh, just on, on, the, on the theme of, uh, of the mob being psychopaths, the, the very final scene, they've, just, they've managed to shoot all the bad guys. They're all laying dead on the floor, bleeding out. And, um, and we get the, the light-hearted score, and then they just start laughing, laughing like fuck. <laughs> <laughs> well, it is an Eddie Murphy movie. You can't help yourself. Your sides will split when you watch Beverly Hills Cop 3 in the cinema. <laughs> and you got Judge Reinhold's character, like, literally been shot with a machine gun several times. Yeah. And he's just sort of bleeding out. That's hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> <sighs> okay, so ratings then? So you go first and you're going to be wrong. I, I stand by it. I think this is a, a huge, huge improvement over the second one. But then I thought the second one was indefensibly awful um so for this one i i give it a five out of ten it's kind of the level i thought the second one was gonna hit and it didn't well i've gone the opposite way really i thought this one was indefensible i give this a, a two out of ten yeah i gave it a two as well and I, I i honestly i'm sitting here thinking what were the two marks for and i can't really think what, <laughs> why it gets two but anything less would probably take the piss so two hey eddie murphy don't get out of bed for less than two man <laughs> he does <laughs> <laughs> Pluto Nash. So yeah, I mean Beverly Hills Cop Three was not the career reinvention that Eddie Murphy was looking for, but a couple of years later he did The Nutty Professor, and that was uh, the career reinvention um, as a sort of more family friendly. I'll play six parts, thanks. Kind of. Uh, oh Sherman, version. Sherman Clump. Oh buddy, love. I'm Grant, Granny, Granny Clump. I'm Granny. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Papa Club! Oh, my little Hercules! Hercules! <laughs> Have you never seen the club, Scarif? No, I tell you, I'm, 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 I'm looking, I'm scrolling up um, Eddie Murphy's IMDb page at the moment, <laughs> and after Beverly Hills Cop Three, the only films of his I've seen are the Shrek films. <laughs> oh, I've literally seen none of those '90s films at all. The Naughty Professor ones are. Um, um, a, a, a feast to watch because he is playing like seven characters. He plays the yeah, entire but, family. It's bizarre. But I imagine that uh, you know uh, Gareth reviews films he hasn't seen. They're 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 not they're just family comedies, aren't they? That's fine. Yeah, yeah. That, that's the, that's my problem with Beverly Hills Cop Three. It's trying to be a family comedy, but it's it's just not quite making it. I was asking nominated for Dream Girls. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you were. The man got pipes on him. I got pipes. I can see. <laughs> I'm a singing talking donkey. Beverly Hills Cop has had a lot of talk of sequels. And in fact, theoretically, there is a Beverly Hills Cop 4 coming out. But also when I looked into it, they've been they've been saying that for several years. But it was like the last thing I could find was from like a year ago where they're going, oh, yeah, we're ready to go into production. It's going to be made. Well, I was looking into his Shrek and I think actually you'll find they've made... 90,210 Beverly Hills cops. Because the top result, you, you type Beverly Hills in there, what's the top one that comes up? Yeah, that's something else. <laughs> <laughs> the Beverly Hills Chihuahua. That was an <laughs> unofficial sequel. Uh, but there was, there was a TV, well, an attempt at a TV series, which transpired to be essentially a TV movie because it never went anywhere. Well, this is, this is something I... Yeah, I, I knew that they were working on this four slash tv series for forever and i didn't realize until a few hours ago looking it up that the pilot got shot a few years ago <sighs> i'm hastily rewriting my sequel pitch <laughs> <laughs> again continuing the uh tradition of more notable directors than the first film barry sonnenfeld directed it yeah well the concept is that it's his son is the sort of focus of it i think Oh, I got a and whole Ed load of children. And Eddie, uh, so, uh, the Beverly Hills Cop TV show was following the son. Eddie Murphy was just going to be in the pilot to sort of set it up. Uh, and so they, but they wanted him in regularly. He wasn't committing to it. Okay, so, sequel ideas. I mean, my immediate idea was something we actually sort of mentioned earlier, but Axel Foley's youth. So I think a prequel would be the best thing to do. Oh, interesting. You have to get a young, younger person in to play the character. So who are we going to get to play young Shrek? The Shrek is not in it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, I think that's because, like Gareth said earlier, there's, there's must be such an interesting childhood he had, the sort of weird people. And we <laughs> Growing know up as a talking a, donkey, I mean, that can't be easy for nobody. He was a bit of a tear away before he, he joined the police. So basically the story, it could be the story of how he kind of gets into crime and sort of has a moral 
quandary and turn around and sort of decide he's going to go the route of justice and probably because a friend of his gets killed by a bad guy and he wants to chase the bad guy and then so he, he ends up joining the police. So I think that would be a really good story. Are we going to have his, are we going to have his friends, the, the, the small time crook and the art gallery woman in there as well? Yeah, and so he meets her. She works at a coffee shop or something. Do you think she saves him? Do you think meet she, her she brings him out of the ghetto? Yeah. I'm not I'm not entirely convinced that a prequel's the way to go just yet. Like has Eddie Murphy retired or something? Didn't he say he was basically done with films? Well he hasn't made much recently. Um, I seem to remember that thousand words and then he can't speak anymore film being his like swan song to cinema or something, bizarrely. Well, it is kind of the last thing he did. Swan song, cool. perhaps being a bit generous. Um, <laughs> dying gasp. <laughs> yeah. The farting. You know, corpses shit themselves when they die. That might be more apt. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't that. that. That's a beautiful. <laughs> I haven't seen it. I'm just assuming. <laughs> I I have seen it because I thought that seems a weird concept. But it was fine. It was all right. I think whilst Eddie Murphy's still alive, you want to. You want to, you know, he's your Harrison Ford to this franchise. Pull him well, in of course. Yeah, but the thing is, you would have him in the film playing, like, a different character. But because he's covered in so much makeup, because he's such a good character actor, you wouldn't even know it was him. Um, so, Gareth, did you have any thoughts? Well, I, I, I kind of gave some thought to um, Beverly Hillbilly's cop. And, <laughs> and having, having Granny saying, you know, what we're all thinking. But I, I, to be honest, I didn't get very far with this because I I, I, I never really watched Beverly Hillbilly, so I'm not going <laughs> to get any references. So. And what, what else can we do? The, the Real Housewives of Beverly Hills Cop? I was <laughs> not Eddie Murphy's nine wives <laughs> chasing, well, Beverly him, Hills. chasing after him for uh, child support. One of them's a dragon. <laughs> That's Mel B. Where did the, where did the Beverly Hills... XYZ naming convention come from? Is everything just referencing Beverly Hills Cop or is that a reference to something else? Because, you know, Beverly Hills Ninja, Beverly Hills Chihuahua. I think they're all after Beverly Hills Cop, yeah. I think Beverly Hills Cop set set the mould. Beverly Hills Donkey! (laughs) Am I right, Shay? Can I can I pitch a real idea, actually, that I've just had? What I think is the actual best way to do this. Okay. I think... I think animated sitcom. I think comedy cartoon. Voiced by Eddie Murphy, so you've got him in. Yeah, but it would be... I think genuinely that would be really good. I think that would... It would be the further adventures of the same character. So you're not you're not doing the cheap sequel thing of Son of or prequel or any of that stuff. Or he's, like, way too old. You can keep it true to the original universe. And well, would you would you say in the 80s? Yeah, I think I think I think in this day and age, yeah. I think play up the nostalgia that comes with Beverly Hills Cop. Ignore the second and third film entirely. Set it like in the immediate aftermath of the uh first one. Well, we do we know Eddie Murphy's best work is as a voice actor now. Exactly. So, yeah, good work. Are I think, all the voices think... done by Eddie Murphy or do we have other cast? <laughs> he did do a series actually, didn't he? He did um the PJs for Fox, mm, yeah, if you've ever yeah, seen yeah. that. It wasn't amazing, but... Uh, so, you know, there's precedent for him doing this sort of thing. If they announced that, I'd be like, yeah. Are you aiming at a family-friendly audience? Though, no, no, going... no. It's probably going to be on Netflix. I think we should get Donald Glover to write it. <laughs> okay. Because his Deadpool series for Fox, he was writing an animated Deadpool series that was going to be like a an ongoing sitcom, and then Marvel didn't want to pick it up because doesn't doesn't fit with their family friendly brand really and fox were like that's a shame we would have had that so just give him a new ip beverly hills cop instead of deadpool it's vaguely in the same ballpark they can probably work some of the ideas they had into it uh yeah all right anything else mike myers does multiple voices in the shrek films you saying he's gonna come in for your animated show no but uh, eddie murphy only does one for donkey who who's the better master character actor Right, out of Mike Myers, Eddie Murphy, and Dana Carvey, Master of Disguise. <laughs> um, Eddie Murphy. <laughs> no, no, Eddie Murphy. Eddie Murphy's probably better at the makeup, but he's always Eddie Murphy in yeah. makeup. <laughs> no, he has his stock characters. He has his like preacher guy. Uh, yeah, Shrek. Read the Bible, Shrek. <laughs> That's not what he does. What was uh and then then on the other hand, you've got Mike Myers, 
He can do Scottish ogres. Oh, he's oh he's excellent at Scottish song. He can oh. do Scottish fat guys. He can do <laughs> Scottish leprechauns. <laughs> he can do Scottish axe murderer. Yeah, axe murderer's the, dad. The dad of this. Yeah, one. yeah. I mean, it's a pretty good range. <laughs> Anything you want, as long as it's Scottish, he'll do it. They've, they've had pretty similar careers, actually, haven't they? Uh, well, yeah, Saturday Night Live, and then Res- well, yeah, you know, well-respected comedy, uh, very good comedy co- film career, and then downhill from there. W- increasingly watered down, broader, big character-driven. How many characters can we do in weird makeup? Then no, because Mike Myers was not... always a comedy character, a comedy character actor. Eddie Murphy was a huge bankable star. He was well, an was action a star. He I was suppose. a stand-up. Yeah. yeah, he and was. Then... Eddie Murphy was so much more mainstream than Mike Myers ever was, and it didn't last. Mainstream, more mainstream than yeah, baby, yeah, groovy, baby, definitely, definitely, yeah, because, yeah. because I'm, I'm, I'm because that was shagging, baby. Because that was, <laughs> Austin Powers was the big character, yeah, but. Eddie Murphy was Eddie Murphy, and he was Eddie Murphy in all these films, and he was a star. He was a Hollywood star. Mike Myers was a comedy star. Scotty Dote! I don't know what that means. I love gold! <laughs> <laughs> all right. Are we done? <laughs> George Lucas was in Beverly Hills Cop 3. Steven Spielberg was in Goldmember. The parallels are endless. <laughs>